Hi there, it's Brian Sebastian. Movie reviews of movement on TV.tv, I Team 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and the Worldwide TV Network. And so we're back for show number two today. So Terry Marie nonstop out of Redondo Beach, California. I'm in Vegas, obviously, right now. And then, so Tony, introduce yourself. Who are you and where'd you come from? Where did I come from? My name is Tony Braunegel. Um, I'm a drummer and, uh, and a producer, and I live in Los Angeles, California, uh, in particular Studio City. And uh, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, and I grew up playing in the music scene there and left the early 70s and moved to New York, blah, blah, blah. And then I went to London for five years, and then I moved out here in 1979, and I've been touring and, and recording um, with different artists, uh, TV shows and film scores and stuff like that. Uh, ever since. I'm still doing it. That's great. There's not great a lot of, Terry, you like that intro? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tony, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of drummers, percussionists who could actually say they're composers. You're one of the few. What's that feeling like? Well, I, I, you know, a long time ago, I got a feel for writing songs and I decided, you know, with, with the three chords that I knew on the, on the guitar that I could actually write songs doing that because of, of most really big hit songs are not, you don't have to have a, a large knowledge of, of chords. Later on, of course, you learn substitutions and, and relative chords and whatnot. And you were able to make things a little more melodic doing that. And, but initially I just started out writing from a very rootsy sort of standpoint and, and uh, keeping it simple like that. And for years, I, I you know, I was, I've, I'm a published songwriter, but nothing major. I have no major songs and no hits and, you know, a few good covers. To the point that I kind of stopped at do, writing songs for a while because um, I became a full-time player and I was either in the studio when I was at home or on the road with someone for months at a time. And I stopped writing so much. Then when I started producing again, or started producing about 20 years ago, I found out that the process of taking an artist's song and getting it ready for the studio sometimes meant that you had to intervene on the composition somewhat. And um, so what I would do is I would say, hey, um, maybe we should move the third verse to the second verse and then you write a new third verse because it doesn't sound like there's three acts in this play or maybe this song needs a bridge. Why don't you, why don't we do this? And, and well, I don't know how, what do you mean a bridge? And I'd, I would throw in, okay, here you go. I'd pick up my guitar, go to the piano and I'd throw this chord in there. And they go, oh, I see what you mean. And, well, what do we say here? And then I would help them and coach them and I'd write the bridge or I'd rewrite the third verse or whatever. And it got to the point to where some of the artists that I've worked with or I've now, I just basically co-write with them. I say, send me whatever you got as rough as it is. And I'll, let me help you direct where it's, where you're going. I, that is if you're not ready to finish it, if you're ready to finish it, I'll never get in your way. But if you, you need someone to help you get it so it's ready to be recorded, I'd like to help you get it to that point. And with, you know, I'm not saying uh, e egotistically anything, but with a high level of standards, I'd like to, for us to have an opportunity to tell the story in the best way possible. So that's how I started writing. And how does it feel? Well, the other side of that is, as a drummer, it makes me more of a song drummer as opposed to playing for myself. And Which I'll is very to... unique, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um... I, I love this stuff is uh, Michael Narada Walden. He did yeah. some Madonna, but you know, I didn't know he was the singer for the longest time because sometimes you wouldn't see him, but back in the seventies, you wouldn't see them. You just hear them drumming. But I would, I, I miss the albums where you can look on the liner notes and you see who actually wrote songs and stuff like that. I always found that fascinating because I'm not that guy, but I thought it was always very unique to see those things because the process, if I had to do it, I couldn't do it if my life depended on it. But I think it's challenging, but also rewarding, wouldn't you think? Oh, yeah, it is. When you, you know, however, whatever you have to go through, whatever sort of humility uh, scope you have to go through for a minute, you know, uh, while you're, when you write something and, it, and it's recorded and you, you know, you, you go, is that good enough? You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and it's not so much that it's doubt, you're doubtful of yourself. It's just that you just don't want to take, you, you don't want to not make it as good as you possibly can, you know, and it's, and taking chances is part of it, but at the same time, making it right is what you're after. And at the end of the day, if you get that feeling, you know, the old thing is, the, the old, that old saying, gut, the gut instinct or whatever. When you get that feeling that it's right, you've completed your emotion, you've completed your message and song, excellent. 
you know, and, and it's a, and it's a great feeling to do that. Um, but not everybody gets that opportunity. And that's, the, that's, that's a part of, of music, for instance, that a lot of people don't think about. They think, oh, you go take lessons and you play these notes here. But then the other people who are making the music, they might go take lessons and learn these notes here and be able to read these notes and do everything else. But what comes out of here and the heart and what life throws at you that you write about is extremely important. I, this morning I woke up, I, a, a new artist that I'm putting a deal together for right now. And, and I, 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 last evening I kind of went, well, we got a lot of songs to write in um, two months here. <laughs> We're supposed to go in the studio at the end of October. And I went, okay, just sleep on it. And I woke up in the morning and I have three ideas right away. And I didn't want to get up out of bed, but I couldn't stop. And I opened up my phone and I put all three ideas down right away. And I thought, well, okay, these are just seeds. Now I'll present them to the artist and say, you want to try something this way, try something this way. You know, when you're looking at 12 songs, you want to have contrast. You want to cover um, as much territory as you can on what the artist is about, you know, in their style and not everything sound the same, but so I'm trying to create that contrast and, and give like a, a graphic kind of over here, let's do this. Let's have this type of tempo there. Let's have this type of melodic thing here. Just kind of lead for the, the areas. And afterwards you fill in all the puzzle, you know, later on. Who inspires you with, as far as your work and music? Who? Who inspires you? Who inspires me? Oh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I go way back to, I go way back to rhythm and blues and gospel. And when I was a kid coming up, uh, my father was way into country music and I listened to a lot of country music. And then the funny story, it's supposed to be funny anyhow, growing up in Texas and everything, uh, that my cousin who ba would babysit me for occasionally would be playing music from the two African-American stations in town. And um, um, so all of a sudden I got hooked on that music at the age of 10, nine or 10 or something like that. And then when I started playing when I was about 13 and really started playing when I was 15, that's the music I started playing. So I've always gone back to the classic part of American music, which is rhythm and blues. And then later on, I realized exactly where the blues came from. And I realized the travel from another part of the world to here and how that di diaspora, diaspora, or how you say it, diaspora uh, mm -hmm. of, of of that culture moved into the United States of America and then it became American music. And now everybody else in the world has copied what we did because of that, that geography, you know what I mean? Because of what happened when those people, when the, the slaves came over and they brought what they brought. And that's uh -huh. the people in the United States of America that lived in the areas rurally that they were lived in. They created a type of music. It was called blues. That was the first thing as first American music. And jazz was just down the river that was in Mississippi and jazz is just down the river in, in New Orleans. And everything came from that except for Gaelic music, Scottish, Irish, you know, everything, all of that's different. That's, that's a whole, but a lot of that fused together to become what we have as the music that we've been listening to since we were kids. And, and I got interested in it because of those roots and I'm still interested in, in those roots and I'm still studying it and I'm still paying attention to, the old masters and the creaky little scratchy records and you know the, the not the poorly made recordings and <laughs> and all that kind of stuff and i'm still turned on by that and i'm turned on by the people who created this stuff a lot that's mostly what i'm inspired by honestly there are a lot of people today you know in modern times that are really good and um i don't know am i inspired yeah i'm inspired i mean i'm entertained and mm -hmm. sometimes inspired but really, my inspiration goes back to those roots. What was it like when you got the chance to work with B.B. King? How did that come about? <laughs> well, in initially, I'd been playing uh, with artists that were on the same bill as B.B. King and um, on a few different occasions. Uh, when I was playing with Taj Mahal, when I was playing with Bonnie Raitt, uh, and we were on shows where B.B. King was part of the festival or we were in the same theater together. and. And obviously, BB would be the uh, the the headline act, and we would be the opening act or whatever. Uh, and um, and got to be around BB enough to know what a character he was, and 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 how much personality was there, and how real it was, and what a great guy he was. But then I was asked to go in the studio. 
and play on a track that was, uh, it was called, not duets, it was called, uh, oh, I can't remember. I think it, I think it got a Grammy, it won a Grammy, it was called, it, it was basically him with a lot of different artists, duets. And he did The Thrill Is Gone with Tracy Chapman, the two wow. of them singing live while he's playing guitar. They sat across from each other in a booth with their own separate microphones and he had a guitar and we had bass, drums, rhythm guitar, two keyboards, uh, strings and horns all at the same time live playing The Thrill Is Gone, a, a redux of The Thrill Is Gone. It was amazing because BB was the kind of guy that would make everybody in the room feel good. It didn't matter what the situation was. He was never, he never let it become awkward. He had such beautiful, wonderful manners. And he was, had such a kind heart that he made everybody else feel good when they were in the room with him. Amazing guy. Incredible. Incredible. Did you, uh, did you like being on the road touring or were you more of that studio session guy? Both. Um, I liked both. I liked, I liked the road more than I do now. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a younger guy's game. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, you know, once you get to a certain age, the road just beats you up too much because people don't understand. You think, Oh, look at those guys up there on stage. Look, don't they look great? They've got really nice flashy clothes on. They're up there performing and everything. And they, and they look like that because they're, they love what they do and they're inspired when they get up there and the adrenaline takes over and da, da, da. What you don't know is they slept two hours last night and traveled 14 to get where they got. They have a bad meal, check into the hotel late, the night, you know, hot water, you got a shower anyhow, you went to the gig, you showed up, you got on stage, you still had to look like a million bucks. Get back on the bus that night or get up the next morning and fly, whatever you did, and and be the same way the next day. And you ha you really couldn't like, you couldn't sit there and go, mm -hmm. how's tonight's show? Oh, let's play. All right. You could never do that. You know, you know, you had to be there all the time. And uh, after, after a while, I guess my, um, you know, age caught up with me and it said, you don't need to do this and don't do this as much. And so I, I actually, I actually pulled off for uh, a while there after the, um, in the two, you know, after the, the two, when it became about 2002, 2003, I pulled off. I was on a TV show for eight years. I had a recurring role and I kind of enjoyed being at home and being in the studio more. And then around 2009, I got asked to go out on the road again with uh, Robert Cray and uh, something else happened in my life right then that made me want to be gone, <laughs> a separation, like a divorce, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to be out traveling a little bit more and I did and I had a great time and I did four years with Robert and, and we made two albums and we did a live DVD and, and that, that kicked me in the butt a little bit. And then I, I went out for another three and a half years after that with Eric Burden from Eric Burden and the Animals because I had produced at that point then my third album with him and um, they needed a drummer. And so I went, okay, I'm ready to go. So I took off and, and at the end of that, run in about 2016 i remember laying in the hotel room one day going oh really this is it huh okay and i went yeah i don't think so so i kind of said i think i'm done and um i'm gonna go stay home and i'm gonna just produce and if i can produce three four records a year i still call them records three four mm -hmm. albums a year i'll be fine and i've done three or four or five or even six since then sometimes so um, I'm done with, I mean, if, you know, if I go out on the road next year, it'll be, now mind you, I, I'm in a couple of different bands. I'm still playing with Taj Mahal. So I mean, we have a band called the Phantom Blues Band that tours with Taj Mahal. We've made five records with him. We have number six in the can right now. We're about to make a, a record deal on, and then uh, possibility of a documentary. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, a lot of cool things going on here that we're we're get, uh, ramping up for. So that probably means that next year, or when it's released, I'll have to go out and do some stuff to support it. But um, I'm sure it will be gauged to the age <laughs> of the people because Taj is quite a bit older than me. And um, that, I, that I won't mind because if I can go out for weekends and go to a festival or whatever, or like we had when the COVID hit, we had two 
European weekends uh, away where we would leave on a Tuesday and play on a Friday and a Saturday, you know, leave on a Tuesday, arrive on a Wednesday, take Thursday off, play Friday, Saturday, fly home Sunday, you know, that kind of thing. And those were, those were all canceled. And then everything else that we had long weekends here in the States that were canceled as well. Um, I still play around town when we can, we, that's all been shut down. And I love playing with my friends around town and certain nightclubs and, and bars and whatever where it's just loose and you're just having fun with the music, you know, but yeah, long-term road, road work done, done. When you, does it make it tighter when you can get together with your friends now because everybody got stopped before going on the road? Is it a lot tighter now, do you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Terry, don't you miss like getting together with your friends and having a drink and just, uh, you know, <laughs> or, or something to eat or a pizza, whatever. You well, know? no, I mean, I'm being careful, but I have a certain group of friends that I've been around since this has started um, yeah. and we kind of don't, so uh, don't see other people is that making any sense it's kind of like our little group but um here in redondo beach they have all the restaurants have outdoor dining um so i don't know i mean i miss red carpet events i miss um i miss seeing concerts yeah there's a lot of stuff i miss you know um because i'm a very social person so i think that all of us are kind of missing that kind of stuff i know brian's missing going to the movies yeah um yeah, so I mean, I I can't wait till this this stuff is over. And I'm also I'm a fitness competitor, and I'm doing a show in November, and I don't even know if we're gonna have an audience, and it's gonna be weird. <laughs> so, you know, and that's what I think is weird for anybody as a performer. You know, if you're, you know, a lot of you know, no matter if you're an actor or if you're a musician or if you're an athlete, of performing without an audience, it's just crazy. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. I've got my little mm -hmm. colony of friends, you know, mm -hmm. this couple here, you know, we'll go over there with that couple or mm -hmm. we'll be with two couples and we all know that it, they were all being safe and everything. And, and you know, it, and a couple of weeks ago, we were going to some friend's house and, and two days before my girl got a, a sore throat, but it was from something mm -hmm. else that had happened. And so we went and got a test and the next, we got, the, we got the test results the next morning, but had we not gotten the test and tested positive, negative, we wouldn't have uh, endangered our friends. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've only mm -hmm. been to one, one restaurant outdoors, you know, since this has happened. And I'm a very social person as well. This is really hard on me to not mm -hmm. be hang out with my buddies and, 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 uh, and family and go and see people. And I can't get on a plane and go visit my family in Texas or, my family somewhere else or whatever, you know, and it's, it's very hard, but, but I'm not taking chances. I'm not going to take chances. I'm just not, I'm just don't see there any reason for it. You know, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't add up, you know, it doesn't add up to me. So, uh -huh. and then the thing about not being able to perform with your friend, you know, uh, Oh, the other thing I was going to say is now what we're doing now is taking up, taking over, right. We're doing a podcast and yeah everybody's going and, and, and sitting on their front porch and playing music. And, you know, uh, one of the artists last night, she was, a, she did an hour live on Instagram on IG live and, you know, of her and her boyfriend him playing guitar and her singing. It's great fun. But man, we used to get together that often and have real gigs and play for two or three or four or five hours, you know, and, uh, and it's just, it, it isn't there anymore. It's very, very difficult. And I can't take the chances. Um, I'm not going to take that chance because I don't want to get somebody else sick as well. And um, I, I was called to play a local party for a guy who's really great guy. He's a good fan of this band that I play with. And, and he is, he's well healed and he was ready to like lay a bunch of cash on a bunch of cash on everybody to come play 90 minutes. And I said, without a mask mandate of a room full of people that I don't know, I'm not going to go do it. And so I thought like, you know, I couldn't count the money afterwards, but I thought, well, I could be in the hospital trying to count that money. You know, I'd rather not take that, that chance. So it's very, this is very difficult in the creative spirit, you know, mm -hmm. you're going through this as well. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I am, I mean, Brian knows, I mean, <laughs> I, we do, we, we do a lot of red carpet events. Those are not around. Um, I had a couple of fitness shows I was going to do that were canceled. Um, I mean, I'm a big, I love going to concerts. I mean, music festivals are canceled. It's just like all those stuff that, you know, you do to escape. They're not there, you know, so you're finding other outlets. 
you know, we've taken so we've taken taken it for granted for so many years that when you walk into that venue, uh, that theater, whatever it is, and you hear the music and you see the people and you go imbibe or whatever you or you're moving and and, and mm -hmm. it, there's nothing making you move or have that feeling now of of congregating. You know, uh, it's it's very 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 difficult. I I hope that we can figure out ways to pull out of it. I. I got very bad sort of uh, report the other day from someone corporate on the inside of three major concert promoter ticket da, da, da. I'm not going to mention any names, mm -hmm. you know, but they're major big time international. And this was from one of the CEOs and he said, um, he said, we probably can't book anything till late summer or early fall of 2021 if everything goes well. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's just but, so but, crazy. It's, but it is really true because yeah. Yeah. for the first time, everything is always big in January. There is no CES, Consumer Electronic Show. There is mm -hmm. NAM. There are no film festivals. Right. Um, and I'm setting up stuff one one to one with a lot of the CEOs for technology and things. And then I'm going to probably have to do the same thing for NAM. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time doing this. But again, when it comes to our studio, at least we have a, a, a new clean studio we can do something is, but I still have to be careful booking people because I know where I've been. I haven't been anywhere really, you know, but I don't know where else right, right. have been. So, you know, even when we do our show Tuesday, Terry, you know, I've got my own Lysol, I've got the elliptical hand sanitizers, I've got our restroom kits, you know, we have our PPE stuff. So I'm making people feel comfortable, but there's a lot of people that yeah. don't want to go to the studio and it's understandable. So sometimes yeah. I go mm -hmm. to the room and do a Zoom interview because that's because it's what everybody's going through and it's very tricky. It's I I, I produced this album. The, I think I mentioned an album uh, an artist a while ago. I didn't know I mentioned his name Richard Richard. Well, his name is T Bear, and so we're putting putting out another single in in uh, October, and then the uh, the album's released twelve songs in January, but back in March. April, yeah, he wrote a song like a COVID related song. And so the label was like, oh, we need a video. Uh, can you go in the song studio and record this? I tried with all of these little apps that you have on your phone and everything. Mm -hmm. I tried to make a track sound good with everybody recording it at home. I tried three or four times. I would do it, you know, started out this way. No, it didn't work. Get rid of it, abandon it. Started out another way. And then finally went, I can't do it this way. I just got to get in the studio. And they said, well, we need this. We need this single. I'm going, I said, at the expense of people's lives. And, you know, the only way I can do this is live. So I called a group of musicians. I called the studio. The studio guy said, if we all keep, you know, the mandate and, and the, the consideration alive while we're in here. Okay. Uh, and I called each musician and I spoke to them and I said, you know, you can say no. And several several musicians fantastic musicians that i wanted to use in the studio went no i can't do it no i won't do it sorry i'm not going to be in a room and the people that said yes were all like well how are we doing this i said well i chose a room that has uh, isolation booths for over here two over here and one big one in the back for the keyboards the drums will be in the room and the lead singer playing keyboards will be in a room but everybody that's tw they were 20 feet apart and everybody else was isolated and I wore two masks. I brought in a three-man video crew and an engineer in the studio and myself as the producer, two masks and a bottle of spray in my pocket. So everywhere I, I spray, I wore gloves all day long and everything I touch, I still sprayed. If I took my gloves off, I sprayed. And I'd sprayed everybody else. And I told them when they come, when they come, when you come in, you're gonna get sprayed. I'm gonna, here, let me see your hands, boom. And everybody got through it fine. We got the single and I just thought, I thought afterwards, you know, the, the label wanted this really bad and I'm going, this is a big sacrifice for everybody to take, you know what I mean? You know, to take this chance over, it was, it was a horrible feeling to actually think that I, I'm now responsible for asking these guys to come in here and pause and risk their lives over a piece of music and a video, you know, thank God, nobody got sick. Thank God the recording turned out fantastic. Everybody was really happy with it. Um, the video was edited and turned out really well and, and it's doing re really good. In fact, that's the song I was mentioning to you earlier, Brian, about that got all of that 1.5 million click throughs or whatever. So what's the name of the song? It's called one day at a time by an artist called T bear. 
Capital T, capital B E A R. That's his brand. You know, Tony and Terry, I did a show last night with my, my friend Amber and uh, my other friend, mm -hmm. and I tested it. It was a new studio. It was for her birthday. And we went back and forth on wearing our mask, wearing our shield. It was her birthday party. And it was, she was testing out her new show there. And she wanted her friends, two of her friends there. And it was only five of us in there. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is what you just described, Tony. It's a, it's a, it's a mental feeling because you got to make sure you, you are responsible for everybody. And yes. I didn't know the engineer. And would I do it there? Yes. But I prefer where I'm going to do it in Hollywood because I know my guy and I know he, he set it up specifically mm -hmm. for me and there's nobody else in there. So I'm walking into a foreign studio. And I don't know who was, there was nobody there before, but still it plays on you mentally. So yeah. I had my ellipto hand sanitizer. I gave everybody the restroom kit. I wiped down and then we, we went back and forth. Do we eat our cake on air? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what we went back and forth. So we're eating the cake. We're okay, but still, it's still plays in the back of your mind. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's mentally draining. It was. And, uh, you know, I mean, that day when I finished, it was mentally draining and physically draining. When we got the track and I knew all the files were good and on, I'm sending it to the engineer that's going to mix it and everything. And, and I felt good about it. And I, I discussed the possibility of a couple of the edits and before that I didn't do it on that day that I said, to JJ, I said, you know, a couple of things we'll fix here and da 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 before you mix it and whatnot. But when I left, walked out of the studio that day, which is a studio I know really well, and everybody there, the owner and the engineer and everybody, it's a great studio. Uh, it's called Horse Latitudes. It's in Glendale. It's owned by Robbie Krieger from The Doors. And my friend Michael Dumas is the engineer and his partner. And they, they're really good old school know what they know, know what they're doing but not be too old to know what's good and what's right and, and what's cool but when i got to the car and i just thought about the fact that now i've got to come home to my girlfriend and she was kind of freaked out that i was doing it too honestly and it was it was a moment there where we were looked at each other and i went is she going to be here when i come home you know my or, or am i bringing something home and how horrible that would be that i stood there at the car and i sprayed myself to my glasses off and I sprayed everything before I even got in my car you know and I waited a minute then I got in the car and I sprayed everything in the car and I sprayed myself over and over and over and over till I got home and then I for for a while there our routine was go to the back of the house by the back door take off everything walk in and get a shower and leave it there that's what we were doing in the beginning and and leave our clothes out all night if you have to spray them later wash them whatever and we weren't taking any chances but that responsibility is very hard to accept. And I don't take it for granted at all because I'm the guy who asked everybody to do it. And boy, would I feel bad about that? Yeah, it's my, it's sick. You know, it's, it worried me for a little while. But we all got through it fine. Everybody's fine, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah there, there's there, 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 a lot of people are politicizing what's going on. There's, there's no reason to politicize your health. And, and living and not getting sick from this or per perpetuating this disease. There's no way, there's no reason to, no matter what side you might be on of the, of, the, of, the, of the aisle or whatever, you know, there's just no reason for any of that. And a lot of people are, I don't want to point fingers, and I'm not going to, but people are abusing that, you know, abusing our, they're saying well, their, their rights and their liberties are, are taken away, but, but you could take my rights and my liberty away too if, if I got sick because you were sick. You know. Well, the, the problem is, is too, is that, um, okay, so I actually work in the medical field also, um, and I work with doctors, and so I hear a lot of stories, too. There's so much misinformation out there on what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, the media is not being 100% honest, and I'm, this is coming from physicians' mouths. The testing, sometimes they come back positive when they're negative, so there's false positives. Those are getting reported as positives. So there's an irresponsibility of what's getting reported also. So I think that's causing problems. And I'm not pointing fingers anyway at anybody. I'm just saying, you know, the physicians are upset. Everybody's upset. It's just, it's just, it's unfortunate that that's what's going on. You know, all the, the, the misinformation everywhere I'm, from everybody. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, 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 I, and, and once again, without taking a side, of, <clears throat> without making a political statement or taking a side, why can't it just be dealt with in a very smart way? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you have, if you have smart people telling you to do things, 
don't we always listen to the smart people in the room? If I'm in a room with a bunch of musicians, the smartest guy is the guy I'm going to listen to, you know, with I'm or wherever I am, I'm going to listen to the smart people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to pick up my own mind, but I'm going to listen to the smart people. I'm not going to go, nah, you know what you're talking about. Oh yeah. You're a scientist. Oh, but you don't know what you're talking about. You know, and so our science is bad. Well, science may not be perfect. It is science, but one thing it does have, it is like mathematics in, in one sense and that it's, it is a strong study of nature. And you use nature to learn things from science, just like mathematics constantly mm -hmm. keeps uh, expanding. You know what I mean? Uh, people are still working on mathematical problems. You know what I mean? But at least it's coming from a place where smart people are doing it. Smart people are trying to be, are trying to do it the, the right way. So it's really, it's, it's a tough thing that our country is so divided with this. That's, that's disheartening, you know, to see anybody that goes against that, and once again, I don't want to just judge them or anybody, you know, I mean, I, I have really close you know, friends. But it boils, it does boil down to your health. Like I said, you and I experienced yeah. going to the studio, you knew the owning and I like Bobby Krieger. Um, I didn't know who this studio was my first time going there. I know they want me to utilize it, but I don't know. I don't know. And I, and the, as I was doing the interview, sitting there, I'm like thinking, do I want to use yeah. this? Would I bring my friends in? I don't know. I still don't know. And we were there's yeah. five of us in there. Yeah. Now you were recording for a while. How many how many hours were you guys recording for? Well, eleven to six. You know what I mean. So wow, I, I was I was on time. Good. You guys were wearing yeah, masks that long. Uh, I I had two masks on all day long and gloves on all day long. And 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 in the video. I'm walking around with two masks on and gloves and a bottle in my hand, spraying everything. That was, but that was in May. That you know, and I, I, I had to get it right. You know, uh, I, I'm not quite as. I still carry spray with me. I still wear a mask. I don't wear gloves as often, because we obviously the science has kind of evolved to the point that you're not going to get it on your hands as easily. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get it aerosolization or if it's going to happen. That seems to be the worst way, and that science is that part of the science has been consistent that our aerosolization in a closed area with no mask on is taking a large chance. But other than that, I think we're, I think we're learning some good things about it. And I think there's a, I think there's a, let me go back a second here. There's a lot of really good behavior out there. So I don't mm -hmm. want to point at the, at what I think is bad behavior at all. And, and I, for me, I'm a human being, man. I want everybody to have an opportunity to be, have, have fun and be happy in their lives, you know, and be healthy. And, and most important thing to me, is to stay healthy, you know, all of us. Tony, give me your social media links. Media links? Yeah, your social media. Uh, TonyBronigle.com. Uh, what's my uh, IG? I think it's uh, it's T-O-E-K-N-E-E. -E -E. Um, and uh, I'm Tony Bronigle on Facebook. And my tweet, my Twitter is at Drumsta. Uh, Ambersan, D R U M S T A. And Terry? Uh, Terry Murray, nonstop on all platforms. And then Terry Murray Official is my website. And I want to thank Tony and Terry, obviously, for this episode this week on movie reviews and more. So, hey, I'm going to end it with that. So, on Women on TV, TV IT247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, the Worldwide TV Network. And if you see someone out of smile, Leaves, give them one of yours because as we do, we have to be careful. The world does need it. There's a lot of people suffering. We'll see you next week. Okay.